So yeah, I see questions related to that here. People are asking about regeneration and, and baptism. So is regeneration always tied to baptism? Well, regeneration is certainly tied to baptism. You know, we've got texts like John 3. We've got the washing of regeneration in, in Titus 3. We have, you can watch videos that I've done dealing with baptism texts or listen to podcasts I've done in, in depth. So this is just very over cursory overview here, but uh, you can even look at, you know, Ezekiel, the giving of the new heart is tied to a sprinkling of water. Um, so uh, what I don't think you can do is take the typical kind of reformed approach and divide the sign and the thing signified. They always go together as in I, what I don't see is the notion of empty signs or we can get into that, into that. I don't want to get too into that right now, but um, cause I have plenty of other place uh, places that talk about that. So um, so is that, oh, is regeneration always tied to baptism? So scripture certainly ties regeneration to baptism. It does. But scripture also speaks about being born again through the word of God. So regeneration is worked through the means of grace. Okay. Regeneration is worked through the means of grace, which means that God does regenerate and he regenerates through the word. And what we have to understand in terms of baptism and Martin Luther in his small catechism explains it in saying that it is not the water alone, right? It's not that in baptism, we have magical water. Okay. There's something special or significant. We don't have holy water. What we do have is the word of God. So what Luther says, it's the word of God present in and with the water that has the power, right? So it's the word of God that is proclaimed in and through the sacrament that regenerates. So baptism does regenerate, but it regenerates through the power and efficacy of the spirit working through the word of God in the water, because, you know, there's that language too, of it being like a visible word. It's like the visible gospel. So God works regeneration through the spirit, through the means of grace. And scripture both says that God works through his word and God works through baptism. What that means is that when we have the case of an adult who believes in Christ, we don't say they are not justified if they haven't been baptized. That doesn't make baptism a purely symbolic action afterward. In other words, this has been a criticism that's been leveled against, against Lutherans is that well, you say baptism regenerates, but you're only talking about infants, but for adults, baptism is just a symbol of something. Where I think we have to, I'd say, no, it's, it's not, does not just become a symbol. And this maybe gets at another difference in the way that we're understanding the order salutis is it's not that the steps of the, the steps, because I don't want to use that language, but it's not that the aspects of the order salutis are all kind of one time only things. So it's not that we can say, well, because God regenerated me through the word, baptism now doesn't do anything. Baptism never has, every time bap the baptismal language is used in scripture, it is language of God giving to us. So if the word of God does something and then we get baptized later, we can still say that that baptism is a means of grace. God is still bringing us forgiveness through that baptism. It doesn't mean that we didn't receive forgiveness through the word of God too. And forgiveness is something that is continual, right? Salvation is continual, not, not in like a ter terms of a process, you know, as you find in, in Roman Catholic theology. It's not that there's a process of justification or something. We are declared perfectly and completely righteous, but that perfect declaration that we, that perfect declaration that we are righteous is not one that just happens once. Why do we pray for forgiveness day after day, right? Why does Jesus say in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses? We don't just say, well, thank you that I've been forgiven. We're praying for forgiveness every day. So there's this past, present, and future reality of, of salvation. So we're talking about justification is we're just, we are justified, have been justified. We are justified today as God's continuing to forgive and continuing to declare us righteous because of Christ. And we will be justified in the last day when we have that public declaration in the making of that justification of reality in the resurrection of the dead. So all three of those things are true, past, present, future in terms of justification. So with that being said, then we don't have to say, well, because someone was saved and was justified through the word, that means baptism now doesn't do anything. So it's something that, that we continually, continually receive. 
Um, oh, a continuous regeneration. So the, the word regeneration actually, in, in, this is true in historical reform theology, is that some, and I believe William G.T. Shedd uses it in, ter in terms of a process. There's actually been a difference in terms of how to use that term regeneration. Some people refer to it as that very that first moment of receiving a new heart, but others refer to regeneration as that renewing of the heart process that we would probably usually call, call sanctification. So it depends on how you're really defining defining those terms. The only explicit place where that word regenerate, what well, the word regeneration is used, used twice in the New Testament, I believe. And there's once where Jesus speaks about the regeneration, which is the, the renewal of the earth. And then there's that passage in Titus, which is uh, specifically it is about baptism. So baptism is the washing of regeneration, or at least that's, that's the Lutheran contention, certainly on, on that text. 